So Hello and welcome to the first session of Riddles of Ontology, the intersection of art and experience. The problem of the ontology of artworks has been very much at the front of aesthetic, analytic aesthetics in the last decades. Ever since the publication of Nelson Goodman's Languages of Art, a whole plethora of positions have emerged in this regard. From Goodman's nominalism and Gregory Curry's eventual uh, uh, Platonism to David Davies' performative theory, analytic philosophy has been trying to cope with the variability of art practice and its condition of existence. This seminar takes its variety not just as a disagreement regarding the ontological status of art, among which one can choose, but as a symptom of a difficulty stemming from the practice of art itself. In this sense, the first part of the course intends to be a presentation and a critique of most of the existing positions within the analytical ontology of art. By taking ontology and the variability exhibited therein as a symptom rather than a solution, we propose to expose the ontological approach as concealing rather than explicating the dynamics proper to the practice of art itself. The second part of the seminar changes modes from the presentation and description to the perspective. Our central hypothesis is then used to guide us through an elaboration of two different tendencies present in the field of aesthetics, which tries to either supersede it or hack it from within. Those that we themasize under the heading experience against art, represented in this seminar by the thought and practice of the Cajun avant-garde, and those we call art against experience, in which the autonomy of artistic practice is used as a means to criticize not just empirical reality as Adorno would have it, but as the normative infrastructure that is responsible for the emergence of artworks. This last hypothesis is equivalent to the taking of the normativity of action, as depicted among others by Wittgenstein, Sellers and Brandon, as material for so-called aesthetic practice, offering a critique of that which, a virtue of being concealed between experience, is a condition of aesthetic experience itself. First, the ontology of arts in its limits. The first module addresses briefly a number of different positions regarding the ontological status of art, trying to isolate the four components of the questioning itself. What is art? What are artworks? How do we know something to be an artwork? How do we know something to be the artwork that is? Second, the critique of ontology. The second module investigates a few critiques of the ontological impulse itself. For instance, Goodman's own question, what is art, which purports to displace the classic. What is art? Arthur Danto's return to the Hegelian thesis of the end of art. Lydia Guerre's critique of ontology as regarding particularly music as articulated in her imaginary museum of musical works, amongst others. The purpose of this of the class is by approaching a number of critiques to displace ontology from the definition of the objects of art towards an investigation of the con constitution of the field itself which conditions the emergence of such objects. Third, experienced against art. Peter Berger proposes a reading of the avant-garde as a demand for aesthetic experience to surpass the autonomous sphere of art and dissolve into vital praxis itself. Notwithstanding Berger's denunciation of what he calls the neo-avant-gardes of the 60s, we see John Cage thinking as a, especially fitting this description. Cage 
exhortation to let sounds be sounds would be akin to an opening to what Adorno calls the empirical that lies outside of the work in its monadic character. This class proposes a critique of institutional critique by examining some assumptions and consequences of the Cajun artwork. Fourth, art against experience. The opening of an art to experience has exposed to view not only the limits of what counts as the artwork, but the normative functioning of the artwork itself. Here, art's autonomy serves as a convenient leverage to construct a laboratory of the exploration of the normativity of action itself. The rules that were once cons constitutive of what counts as an artwork are now subjected to the labor of elaboration. Dialectically, art's autonomy serves then also as a means for an unautonomization. The outside which in Cajun aesthetics was supposed to pass through the inside was always already cons constitutive of the practice. Constitutive dissociations as philosophy and artist Henry Flint proposes make explicit art as a species of the generic practice of production, turning it into a production of generic practices. This seminar is led by J.P. Caron. He is a philosopher and artist based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. His doctoral research developed as both the University of Paris and the University of Sao Paulo proposed a critique of the aesthetic philosophy of John Cage in the context of contemporary ontology of art and philosophy of language. He's a lecturer in philosophy at the Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and he militates in the circle of studies of the idea and ideology, an international political collective dedicated to examining the viability of the communist hypothesis today. I'm now giving the mic to Jean Pierre. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, uh, uh, do we know exactly how many people are, uh, uh, how many inscriptions do you have, uh, Patrick? Wait, I'll, 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 I'll... How many, how many people are, are sub subscribed to this course? Do, do, you, do you have the number? I have eight. I have eight people who are uh, okay. of this course. Okay, so uh, not everybody is still here, right? Because I was, I was going to, okay, I was going to start uh, by asking you guys to present yourselves perhaps so i have a, a grasp of, of your of your background and your interests and everything so do anybody wants to to start because i mean patrick just, yeah, just, start. just read my just read my bio i want your bio as well so <laughs> <laughs> can you guys hear me hello Okay. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm a uh, undergraduate philosophy student in computer science at University of Florida. Um, I've never really studied any philosophy of art or aesthetics or any art theory at all, to be honest. But I'm really interested to learn about in this course. Interested to see how you tie it back into Southers and Brandon and Wittgenstein. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm doing a uh, CECL intensive with the new center. I just finished the uh, Revenge of Reason course with Daniel Sanchilato. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a great course. Really got me a lot more interested in looking up kind of functional accounts of mind. And, yeah, it's great. Okay, anybody else want to present present himself? Yeah, sure, I will. Um, my name is Yamine, Yamine Chaudhry. I'm, uh, I spend half my time in Karachi and the other half in the US, where I am right now. Um, I'm an artist and a writer, and I've taught a lot in, in Pakistan and Karachi. Um, currently, I've been thinking about the uh, 
architectures of aspiration in very quickly developing cities in South Asia, particularly Karachi and coastal development. And um, I'm just beginning a project with a friend of mine that's going to be kind of archiving histories of the coastline using audio and uh, creating a, a sort of live recording booth on the beach, um, recording and archiving a disappearing commons uh, against a sort of, um, you know, the capitalist um, encroachment of free space, free land. So we're kind of uh, in the process of kind of gathering the, the, the sort of theory for the project, building a website and then actually doing the practice and figuring out how to disperse that on radio and uh, podcast. So that's me right now. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Very thorough. Very thorough. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Who's next? I really. Well, yeah, I really. Yeah. So. Then I'll just ask Roberto and then Quinn yeah, okay. and then Arti. Roberto, can you? Super. Yes. I can see you. Yes. Great. Hi, I'm I'm Roberto. I'm uh, based in Guatemala. I'm. Uh, have a background in architecture and urbanism. I'm currently uh, a member of Autonomia Cooperative, which is uh, a work around uh, cooperative hedge fund and uh, architecture uh, uh, practice. And uh, uh, in my case, I'm currently uh, researching on uh, uh, options based uh, financial systems and its relationship with the uh, uh, production of space. So that's uh, that's about it. That's, that's great. Thank you. Quid. Uh, I I can sadly not mute, unmute you. Thanks a lot for unmuting yourself. Yeah, no problem. Um, so my name is uh, Kid Love. Uh, they them pronouns. Uh, I'm from Seattle. Um, and I'm a uh, kind of a transmedia artist, filmmaker, uh, computer programmer. Uh, I work at the University of Washington. Uh, and I also um, do uh, kind of independent, independent filmmaking stuff. I'm currently working, uh, finishing up a documentary on uh, Lyme disease uh, with the Institute of Systems Biology here in Seattle. Uh, and uh, working towards relaunching a digital magazine on uh, basically mobile art making or making uh, art with mobile devices, yeah. uh, so music and film and sort of photography and such. That's great. Thank you. Arti. Arti. Hi. Uh, can you see me? Yes. And hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Aarti Sundar. I'm from Chennai in South India. Uh, I have been currently looking at um, uh, slightly around the nature experience itself, how we experience um, different kind of interfaces and how technological, analogical, and digital, and how it sort of changes the way we produce art and how the birth of platforms within the art market itself has changed the nature of how we sort of interact with art. So um, that's where I am right now. And so I'm great. actually looking forward to this uh, class as well. OK, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so uh, I see there's a lot of interest in architecture. Maybe I should have put a little bit more of emphasis uh, on uh, art on perhaps, for instance, Goodman's treatment of architecture in his text, but okay, too late for that. Maybe we'll we'll change emphasis as we as we go along. All right. So uh, maybe I, I think it's uh, it would be a good moment to ask students if they want to be presenters and respondents for next okay. time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's my first time in the new center, so Patrick is giving me the the usual rituals to follow. So okay. Uh, are are there an, anyone that is is interested in uh, presenting uh, next next session? And you said you, we should have a presenter and a respondent, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. 
So anybody interested in presenting and, and another, another one interested in responding to the presentation? Uh, it will be the Liz Scott's text, uh, Post-Cajian Aesthetics and the Event Score, the text to be presented from the, to the, uh, for the next session next week. So anybody wants to do it? No? I, I'm happy to do either. Yes? Yeah. Okay, kid. You so you so you're presenting the Lee Scott's text. It's already there in the Dropbox. So uh, for next week we'll have that because we'll we'll tackling uh, exactly post Cajun aesthetics and its challenge to possible challenges to ontology, which we are surveying today. Right? We're surveying ontology today. So keep in mind. Lee Scott's uh, text is not a text about the ontology of artworks, but it's a text trying to present what uh, she calls, and I'm I'm also calling post-Cajun aesthetics. Uh, so uh, the the idea is to, of course, present the the main ideas of the text, but trying also, if you if possible, to uh, uh, draw some relations relationships to what we are seeing today if possible okay uh, so anybody wants to respond to the to quid's presentation Hutch, can can i maybe ask you to to, to respond because i have never superb because i have not, okay. never had you as a respondent in one of my seminars that would be Okay, so Hutch is, is responding. Okay, fine. Great. So, so we should just dive in it, right? So I'm I'm starting to uh, I will uh, uh, share my PowerPoint, my, the screen of the PowerPoint with you guys, and I have some annotations, and I will follow from these annotations and developing developing as, as we go along so please if you have any questions do interrupt me please and i also will interrupt sometimes to ask for questions right so let me see here where's the where's the powerpoint uh, well it's not here anymore what's going on oh okay Well, it's not appearing anymore. Well, I don't know what's going on here. Just a, just a sec, please. I'll, I'll restart the PowerPoint presentation. Just a sec. Okay, now let me see if it's appearing here in the Hangout, the screen share function of the Hangout. Yes, okay, there we go. Is it, is it appearing there on the Riddles of Ontology? Yes, I can see it. Okay, you can see it, okay, great. So. There's a general introduction. Uh, today is, is kind of difficult, difficult day because it's the beginning, and I should also not only present the, the the content for today's session, but present a general introduction of what the course is all about. I mean, Patrick also already read the the, the course description, but I think we should we should we should delve more deeply into it to have in mind some uh, specific general questions which will be important throughout okay so there's a general introduction i wrote there 
present course intends to give a critical introduction to some problems pertaining both to the ontology of artworks with an emphasis on music, because this is my background. I mean, this is not in my bio. I, I think it's not in my bio as Patrick read, but my first, uh, my first, uh, 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 my, my first uh, profession was as a musician, and then I went imminently because of the problems that I appear to me as a as a music practitioner uh, to philosophy. Right, so. Uh, uh, the problems pertaining both to the ontology of artworks with an emphasis on music and the challenge challenge proposed to it by so-called post cajun aesthetics. In due time, this will take the form of a clash between analytic ontology and a philosophy of language and action using the problems of the identification of artworks, particularly those that are resistant to univocal identification as a battlefield. Okay. This is supposed to show a properly philosophical stake that is embedded in art practice. The question of the exit or not from art will be recast with a pragmatic inferential infrastructure to be harvested from this clash. So I think some of you may, for instance, Hutch may, may understand some of these, uh, the references that are uh, implicit in this in this this paragraph the idea is to start from this ontology i mean analytic ontology of art right and uh, uh, in due time there will be there will be because of the questions posed by ontology itself in its relation with the artworks we will have to change uh, the ontological framework in order to open to so, so to speak to open the black box and to understand the processes of conformation of so-called artworks right and these processes in as in my work as i as i as i developed uh, earlier in, in earlier endeavors uh, these processes uh, are are um, um, described by the inferential or pragmatic infrastructure of these of the practices themselves the idea is to harvest from the philosophies as patrick also read uh, from the philosophies of wittgenstein brandom and sellers uh, in order to understand uh, the connection between action and uh, meaningful action and the uh, concretion of particular artworks as a way as a gateway to, I would say, propose a different ontology, but maybe not so much to propose a different ontology, but to question the idea of ontology itself as it has been proposed in the analytic ontology, in the field of analytic ontology. Okay, so this is this is a general introduction, and uh, uh, then there is uh, an introduction to this introduction that is the, uh, the the area that motivated these preoccupations, right? So the area that first motivated these preoccupations was musical aesthetics. My doctoral thesis, L'Ind Determination à l'Oeuvre, John Cage, L'Identité de l'Oeuvre Musicale, to be published in 2019, approached the problems of the ontology of art as challenged by Cage's oeuvre by transferring them to the theory of action the inferential pragmatic infrastructure of normativity. In it, a model of critical composition was proposed that took not just sounds, but the actions that produced the musical sounds along with the rules, not just of composition, but of acting in accord with the score as its material. So you see there's a shift there of emphasis in what I what someone would would call a musical practice, a properly musical practice, to a kind of generic practice that is uh, harvested from within musical practice, right? And these generic practices has to do have uh, with uh, with the uh, the taking of the action themselves as the actions themselves as material. For elaboration, okay. So this is this is the idea. This opened up a common ground between the aesthetic problems and the political problems, made explicit 
by the replacement of an ontology of art by a mor morphology of the artwork. Okay, I think that you, you will understand this uh, uh, as we go along. And of a static ontology of objects to a dynamic morphology that is an ontology of processes. Cage's anti-correlationist stance, let sounds be sounds, was then requalified as a putative absence of intentional organization in the work, which was supposed to grant it its independence from the subjectivity of the composer, was itself recast as a form of organization. Uh, there is also an implicit, uh, an implicit uh, nod here to the idea of correlationism, the Meia Su uh, philosophical idea that since uh, post-Kantian philosophy, we lost the we lost uh, we lost the world, and we are we are always enclosed in the conditions of givenness of this world, right? So, what 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 is the first thing everybody knows about John Cage? Well, he was trying to somewhat from the musical artistic practice propose some non-correlational practice in the sense that he was trying to give up the intention of the artist as the criteria, criteria of uh, choice and organization of materials in order to let sounds be sounds, right? So there is a very beautiful uh, phrase by a Brazilian philosopher, uh, Vladimir Safatli, who calls Cage like a stoic. He, he, he talks about uh, Cage's stoicism, right? Which consists in the idea that something has to be destroyed in order for this other thing to arrive. What, what, and this other thing, Cage thinks, is nature, nature itself. So normally, the, I mean, the, the most famous phrase that tr that tries to uh, describe Cajun practice is the imitation of nature in its manner of operation, right? This is a very famous turn of phrase. So in order to imitate nature in its manner of operation, something has to be displaced or destroyed. And this is the compositional ego, right? So this is the mainstream way of understanding Cage's stance, artistic, artistic philosophical stance, right? So in order to let sounds be sounds, we have to give up control on these sounds or, or on, if, you, if, we, if we can generalize to any form of art, uh, we have to give up control on the material. So the choice is not anymore guided by a subjective taste or something. So Cage's concept of freedom has to do with the freedom from himself as well. I mean, this is also the mainstream understanding, okay, of Cage's idea. So, what what we usually grasp from this is, uh, in a sense, a an anti-normative stance, an idea that the compositional ego is destroyed, and then there's something which is uh, an imminent chaos, which is nature itself, which arrives because there's no subjectivity in charge anymore, right? This is the basic idea, basic understanding of Cage. What I was, uh, what I was uh, proposing in this project, in this, in this project that, that I already completed, the, which is the doctoral thesis, was that there is also, uh, uh, th there is a requalification of this stance, right? It's not, it's not so much about an absence of intentional organization, so as, I, as I wrote there, which was supposed to grant it its independence from the subjectivity of the composer. So I'm just explaining this rather dense uh, sentence, okay? So this was, was recast as a form of organization. So the, it's, not that, it's not that there is an absence of organization, but the absence of organization is a kind of organization because it shows something else to be organizing, right? So th this other thing that is organizing the work has to do not so much with nature in itself, which is 
for Salarzian like me, uh, um, uh, a form of the myth of the given, but uh, um, it's a uh, but it shows the what I'm, I'm calling the normative infrastructure of the music making itself. That is, for instance, the famous four minutes thirty three seconds piece by Cage, wherein uh, a musician is supposed to make no sounds during this this uh, time interval, right? Uh, what is what is shown there is not so much nature. I mean, not so much the way things are, which is the way he understands nature to be, but the ritual of concert making itself. So there is a normative infrastructure that is at, in place that once you uh, evict a specific artistic content, there still uh, still remains the infrastructure that makes this artistic content possible, right? So it's like a transcendental thing, this 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 uh, Cajun aesthetic, post Cajun aesthetics, right? So this is a this is the basic idea. I'm not focusing on the outside of the work, but I'm focusing on that which is constitutive of the work itself, right? So what is constitutive of the work is not only the sounds that are supposed to uh, be heard, but uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to. Yeah, it's better like this. Uh, not just the sounds, the sounds that are supposed to be heard, but uh, the actions themselves that produce the sounds, and the way these actions are intertwined with this. Uh, the meaning, meaning in language, and the way, and the, I mean, what I'm calling a normative infrastructure is the, is the idea that the meaning is uh, entwined with norms. It's the norms of behavior that are constitutive of the work, right? So I'm not interested per se in enforcing those norms, but while once we recognize norms as that which is uh, uh, constitutive as of a particular form of action or in this case a particular form of art we are open to revising it as well so we can revise norms okay um, so there's some uh, do you want to phrase your question, Hutch? Do you want to make a question? Anybody wants to ask a question at this point? There's there's some questions here. Um, okay, no, this is just a question of organization of the course. Okay, just what what would be a response? Okay, that's not that's not uh, related to what I'm saying. Okay, fine. So, uh, uh, is that? I mean. Um, tentatively clear i mean introductory clear intro, introductorily clear i mean okay so i, I will proceed um, i don't know why every time i stop sharing my powerpoint it's it's not showing anymore in the in the window so i have to strangely uh, Don't understand why. Okay, is it possible to do like this? Maybe from there. No. Okay. Well, let's let's continue. If if there's something I uh, I need to show you, I will restart the PowerPoint again. Okay, but I can just use it for now as a guide, so we don't have to have this these um, interruptions all the time because there's this technical issue here going on so before you proceed sorry i have a quick question yes okay uh, you said in your beginning that there's a kind of nod to correlationism and you yes. said in response to john cage as a provocateur what did you mean there yeah okay uh are you familiar with the mayor uh, uh the idea of correlation is okay fine 
So uh, for the others, maybe somebody is not familiar with it. The idea is that, well, correlationism is the idea that Meyasu puts forward in his Après la Finitude, wherein uh, 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 philosophy would have lost uh, from view the what he, what is called le grand le grand dehors the great outside right so because of the the critical critical uh, uh, the critical philosophy critical uh, uh, language problem now because of the uh, uh, Kantian philosophy the Kantian way of of uh, of putting the philosophical problems in the sense of a of being a problem of uh, access, right? Of, of transcendental access of, to what appears to us not as a uh, as an ad, not not presupposing an adequate adequate representation uh, as as uh, dogmatic realism would have it, right? So we have we are always enclosed in this what he's calling the circle of correlation so this is the basic idea of that there is a correlation is stance going on in post kantian philosophy that was that is what uh, mayus was talking about but uh, well, i think your question is how this correct me if i'm wrong is how this uh, how this is uh, related to the cajun idea right well the, the, it is related in the sense that what Cage wanted to do was to open what would be uh, what would be a, this uh, closure of the work in the sense of it's being identifiable, it's having a determinate structure, right, and it's it's being a result from uh, resulting from the choices of a subjective intentionality, right, towards something which is like what is called nature in its manner of operation is coincidental with a kind of chaos something like this so in a sense it, it is the the K, john cage's idea is in a sense we can we can uh, frame it as a an anti-correlational uh, 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 anti-correlational stance in the artwork i mean is it possible to have non-correlational art something like this so this art is always uh, is not enclosed in a intentional sphere that is the result of a of a subjective choice. Okay, so this is this is what I what I had in mind, but I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not endorsing it though. I think that was clear. I, I was I'm trying to reframe it, reframe it in a uh, in a uh, inferential pragmatic. Uh, in, uh, approach so that the inferential pragmatic approach that is responsible for the constitution of the artwork is, was alre always already there. And this inferential pragmatic approach is not itself represented inside the artwork. By evicting the uh, specific content of a performance as he, as he, he does in 433, right? What appears is not just the outside of the work, but that which is con the condition of constitution of the work because it was the normative infrastructure that gave rise to it. So this was my, 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 my take on this. Okay. Is, is that okay? Is that clear? Okay. Thank you uh all right so then i uh, i don't think we knew i think we just uh it's already half an hour in so i don't know maybe okay there is a then i will i will talk just briefly about this indeterminacy at work and definition for this project the central which is related to what i'm presenting to you in this course right so the central problem analytic ontologies of the musical work tend to emphasize the conditions of identification of the work as a guarantor of its existence okay the idea is something exists because it can be identified right so this is the a problem that i see with analytic ontologies of i mean is, is, this is something that appears generally in analytic ontology of the artworks but appears also more uh, specifically and more dramatically in, in the problem of the musical work. 
So I'm not uh, just a proviso here. I'm, this is not a course on the musical ontology, but because we are talking about post cajun aesthetics, right? The idea is to we will have to delve a little bit in the specifics of, of the ontology of musical works in order to see what's new in post cajun aesthetics and also and for them and then in in order to generalize that which appears in post cajun aesthetics to other art forms okay so there is a kind of a convoluted uh, path going on there okay so uh, just just proviso because it's not it's not really a course about music just to to assure you of that so uh, Analytic ontologies of the musical world tend to emphasize the conditions of identification of the artwork as a guarantor of its existence. Hence, Platonism is one position that, that exists. And it's, uh, it's exemplified by Levinson Kaivi, considers the work the instantiated sound pattern, wherein sound pattern means an abstract, non-spatial temporal pattern that is indicated by the composer in a score. And a second position, nominalism by Nelson Goodman, considers the work to be determined by an inscription in a notational system. We will see what, what that's about. Where in inscription, the idea, the term inscription doesn't have an upper limit. Right? That, that means both a single note and a whole score are inscriptions. Okay? And notational system, the term notational system is a technical term for a symbolic system that preserves a one-to-one -one relationship between marks and compliance. The marks are these inscriptions and the compliance in the case of the musical work are sounds, okay? So we have one, one note, one sound. A one-to-one -one relationship between marks and compliance. The work is the class of performances that perfectly comply with the score. So Woodman's idea is because he's a nominalist, and uh, are you familiar with the idea of nominalism, the, the opposition between Platonism and nominalism, right? Uh, nominalism tries to uh, 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 construct uh, uh, an ontology without uh, the appeal to abstract entities. So Platonism is motivated by the, the, the problem of the, the many in one, okay? So what's going on in Platonism in order to understand Goodman's nominalism? Uh, once, normally, in normal practice, you hear like Be a Beethoven symphony. You can hear it several times, and all of them will be considered an instantiation of the same, which is the Beethoven symphony. So Platonism has to, uh, is trying to give an answer to that. The idea is to have, well, there, there has to be some something invariant in all of these performances in order for it to count as the same. So what Platonism proposes is that this same thing that is present in all of these performances would be an abstract sound pattern. This is kind of contradictory for me because it's a sound pattern, but it is an abstract object in the sense that it's not spatial temporal. So sound, I, I, I would be inclined to say that sound is a spatial, spatial temporal uh, concept, but a sound pattern is not one. It's, this is the pattern that is important, right? So the sound is a sound pattern, pattern, which is an abstract object that is instantiate, instantiated in performance. This is the basic Platonist picture, not in the sense that what Plato would have said, but in the sense that analytic ontology, analytic ontologists who call themselves Platonists, what, what they usually say, right? So uh, against this, what Goodman is trying to propose is a picture that is not uh, dependent on abstract entities. He's trying to reduce abstract entities to some, some other entities, something else, right? So the answer he, he, he comes up with is, 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 is to devise a notational system which has a one-to-one -one relation, wherein there is a one-to-one -one relationship between marks, what he call marks, 
a mark is any inscription, any 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 generic, the generic idea of an inscription of a mark of a graphic mark. And compliance. Compliance is that that which is de determined by a specific mark. And in the case of music, compliance are perhaps sounds or musical notes, etc. Uh, so he's trying to. So there's no abstract object there anymore. Work. The, a work exists in this. Uh, because you can you have a, uh, a rigid criteria of identification which is given by the notational system which is a notational system devised to give this criteria so it's kind of circular because he's he's defending that the basic uh, function of a score is not to tell you what to do but to uh, uh, define the limits of a work what what counts as the work and what does not count as the work this is what he says in languages of art his book so uh there's a price to be paid there right we'll talk about it later there's a price to be paid to, to when you don't have the abstract object anymore you have just this perfect compliance and you have because you don't have an abstract object which is not not a score and not a performance the only way you can uh, identify a performance as being a performance of that particular work is if that performance perfectly comply with the work as depicted in the defined sorry in the notational system so this is what in the literature people call the perfect compliance goodman's perfect compliance this is not just a technical matter then it is also an ontological one because then musical works will have to be fully determined by the notational system right so because you don't have an abstract entity which can have malformed instantiations you can have mistakes in the instantiation in the sense of platonism in the sense of goodman's nominalism you can't have mistakes if you mistake one note what is what he will say is that it's not that you played badly the piece it is that you didn't play the piece because perfectly com perfect compliance is a condition of the for, for the definition of a particular piece okay so this is this this is this problem of the uh, conditions of, this is what i'm calling the conditions of identification as a guarantor of this existence something exists if it can be identified there is a musical work if it can be identified so both positions stem from the consideration of the musical work as a case of one in many. There is some invariance that must be accounted for, right? So post-Cajun aesthetics tends to rely on indeterminacy. That is, there is in principle no way to identify a work from its sound world alone. And this is very important to keep in mind, from its sound world alone, okay? Uh, you can still identify a work from its concept, from uh, what what you're supposed to do, etc. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, we will we will develop a little more this this opposition between Platonism and nominalism as we go along. Next sessions, I think we will uh, periodically go back to this kind of uh, of this concept, this particular concept. Okay. So it's not it's not it's not something we need to understand fully uh, immediately. Okay. So, on the general concept of ontology that I'm that I'm trying to put forward here. So this this introduction to my previous work is over. Now we're we're properly in the in the class that was that was designed for this course. Okay, on the general concept of ontology, critical approach to analytic ontology. This critical approach I'm proposing asks for a clarification on what ontology means here, right? So I use the distinction drawn by Peter Wolfendale between continental and analytic ontologies as stemming from the difference between the question of being qua being, being as being, paradigmatically Heidegger, and being qua totality, paradigmatically Quine. Analytic ontology of art puts itself squarely on the second camp 
as it interrogates among that which exists, to what category of being works of art belong. It is concerned only collaterally with the meaning of being as it only asks about that which is considered as existing and its mode of existence. So basic idea is that uh, what Wolfendale, Wolfendale is talking about in his, in, in his it, I, I can give you the, the uh, reference. Uh, it's in his book about the object on, object oriented ontology, object oriented philosophy, a particular uh, chapter wherein he proposes a kind of history of ontology, uh, wherein there is an opposition between a certain understanding of ontology stemming from the continental tradition and an understanding of ontology stemming from an analytic tradition. He uh, relates each one of these understandings to a different concept of uh, uh, ontology or of metaphysics. So, uh, continental ontology, as in Heidegger, is concerned with the question of being as being. I mean, the meaning of being. What what does it means? What does it mean to to be for for any being whatsoever? So, it's not you. Uh, uh, it's not it's not concerned with which entities exist, right? It's concerned of with what does it mean to exist, okay? So the second concept is the, the analytic one, stems from what, what was called once metaphysica specialis, uh, so the special metaphysics, the domains of beings, the categories of being, right? So the, the question of analytic ontology is more concerned with what is what are the entities that exist and what are their mode of existence so this is very different a very different question right and what is interesting and i think what we can what we can de develop here as a as a theme for for our, for our reflection is the relationships between these two these two ideas of ontology so in a, there is a point in, wherein Wolfendale talks about the way in which uh, uh, ontology as being as totality uh, can be built upon a fundamental ontology, which is being as being. It's a, this is the way Heidegger uh, understands it. So you have fundamental ontology, which is the meaning of being, of a particular being, which is design, which would be the would, would give the way, give way to an opening of the being of other entities. And on top of this, you can construct regional ontologies, which is the categories of beings that there are, okay? And the Quinean method is, 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 is the opposite in, the, in a sense. When he starts his, his famous on what there is, I think the first phrase of the, the essay is something like that. Uh, the the ontological question is very simple. It, it's 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 framed in three. It can be expressed in three uh, uh, monosyllables. What there is, and the answer is everything. And everybody would accept that as true. But the problem is, what composes this totality? Which are the entities that are inside this set of everything? Right. So the question is about what are the entities that exist, not so much about what does it mean to exist, even though in order to uh, propose a concept, propose an ontology in the sense of what, which entities are the existent ones, uh, he has to uh, propose like a meta-ontological criteria, which is his ontological commitment criteria. We, we won't see this today, but the, just the, the, the basic idea is there is a relationship to be constructed between these two concepts. And the, the difference between, as, as, as I think Wolfendale understands, between the continental tradition and the analytic tradition is a difference between a difference in uh, the priority of each, each question, right? So this is just to understand what is the concept we are talking about 
when we talk about an ontology of uh, of artworks here and it's the, it's the concept of an ontology as being in, uh, understood in the sense of being as totality right which are the categories of things that exist so and there are artworks so what kinds of things are artworks how can we individuate this category okay this is the basic question so uh why um a question of uh, a question of uh, method arises right so one is one is tempted to ask then how how does analytic ontology uh, harvest the the uh, proper properties that will enable the construction of a category of what is an artwork okay so analytic ontology is taken to be a philosophical refinement and reification from empirical art practice it takes its cue from elements of contingent practice and turns it into a metaphysical and or logical category respectively platonism metaphysical category because there's an abstract object eternal abstract object right and a logical category and nominalism uh, which i which i'm 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 relating to nominalism right okay it, it analytic ontology exemplifies both one elements of common practice that are supposed to be necessary and are thus selected by ontology in a way analytic ontology concerns us as a symptom of what is taken to be necessary in the concept of an artwork okay. and b against itself it exemplifies a way that philosophy by obeying its own momentum while responding to a common sense notion come to produce models that distance themselves from their targets okay this will be this will be more clear i, th I think by the end of the session but the idea basic idea is by proposing such a determined concept of of uh for instance a musical work nelson goodman is is uh, uh constructing an object like a model in order to understand how does a musical notation works in order to define uh, a particular uh, a particular object or a particular thing in the world uh, but by doing so by obeying to the theoretical momentum itself it's it, his his model is there there are properties in the model that uh, uh, separates it from the target in the sense that in in normal art in normal musical practice you don't have to have perfect compliance perfect compliance is desirable but in order to count as the musical work which that performance is supposed to be you don't have to have it's not a condition a necessary condition uh, to have perfect compliance but in goodman's model you have to have absolutely perfect compliance so what is interesting in this this analytic ontology uh, idea is that uh, there is this uh, relationship to a common practice because you have to have your you have to uh, harvest the uh, elements for the ontology from some 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 place somewhere and what being an ontology of art, this place will be the common practice of art, right? But as you construct an ontology, you are constructing like a ideal model of this, of this practice, and the practice is not obeying the ontology in a sense. So you don't understand. There is a there is like an indetermination in the sense that is is the ontology supposed to be descriptive of the practice? Or is the ontology a, a, a separate construction, different from the practice? So this is this is like a tension, a theoretical tension that there is lies there within analytic ontology that we can use as a leverage in order to construct something else, right? Uh, okay, already 
talked about this. Any question now, for now? I, I talked like for more half an hour now, so uh, are there any clarifications? Alex, I wrote something. Can you can you read your, your question, Alex, for the video? I mean, yeah, sure. I, I think it's better, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I was just thinking in terms of like uh, uh, data ontologies might be seen as kind of a limiting case of the ontology as totality idea, wherein you have some data set that you need to account for. And so you say that there is some sort of uh, relations between the entities in the data set and um, and that there are, the, there are such and such entities and they fall into these categories. So this would be where it doesn't really matter ultimately like what the ultimate nature of those things are, but if you can account for them within this uh, this structure that is given by the ontology, then it suffices. Yeah, but what what's the question exactly? Can you frame this as a question? I mean, um, no, I wasn't really framing it as a question. Okay. So, okay. Um, it was okay. it was more of a comment, which is why I was in the sidebar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I I agree with you. But in the in the case you see in the case of uh, the ontology of artworks, this is kind of different, right? Uh, because they are not interested in constructing like a database or something like that. Is They are interested in capturing the ways of being of these things called artworks. So, uh, and this is a, actually what you are saying has implicit in it uh, a very good question about the function of ontology in, in the particular, in the sense of this particular field of the ontology of the of the artwork, right? So there are some 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 philosophers that are interested in uh, uh, making up uh, ontology as something that can be useful for art practice, and there are some that are not interested in that. So, for instance, uh, <coughs> I will uh, uh, in a moment dive into the, the, the difference between uh, conceptual analysis and ontology, which is kind of a difficult uh, subject in itself. There is this uh, theoretician, uh, Morris White, that wrote on the role of, uh, on the role of uh, theory in aesthetics, right? This, this very seminal uh, article which defends that we can't uh, really uh, give a definition of art because art is always changing. So uh, he, he uses uh, Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance in order to understand the concept of art. He is saying, oh, the concept of art or the concept of an artwork is a concept that is... Uh, uh, which which is which which uh, intrinsic logic is a, a one of family resemblance, not one of a closed category of a closed concept. And then against the against this position, you can have someone somebody somebody like Roger Puyvet, which is a French ontologist. He's uh, defending the idea that well, he's criticizing whites for confusing cr uh, criteria of identification of a particular artwork with the definition of art. And I have here the, the quotation, just a second. Uh, yeah. What Puive says is, it will be, however, to confuse the question of the nature of works of art, an ontological question, what is a work of art, and that of the infallible criterion of their identification, an epistemological question. How do we know if this is a work of art? A definition is not a touchstone, like the one used to make, make sure something is in gold, that allows us to place in museums, exhibitions, library, specialty departments and concerts, everything that needs to be done to be there. Finally, the discovery of the right definition, if we succeed, will have no effect on our ability to identify works of art and therefore on criticism. This is a very extreme position, in my view, by Roger Puyvet, in which the definition of art is 
a merely uh, philosophical exercise. So a question arises, if you understand it that way, which is what is then the relationship between art as defined and art as practicized, right? So there's a gap in there. If you just defend you from one side unilaterally, the philosophical from the philosophical side that, side that definition of art it does not respond to the necessity of identifying an artwork. So you are creating a gap between those. But then you are also creating a gap if you if you take identification of the artwork as a symptom of the of its existence, as as I was saying before, because in the Goodman picture you are proposing like a definition of a class that is that will be will count as a in this in this case a musical work and uh, uh, this class is uh, resulting from a property that can't be really present in art practice itself so there is always this negotiation between the, the the need for a purified concept that is present in ontology and that which is going on in practice itself so this is the question also not just the question of the i mean, I mean i'm not framing any as the question of uh, adequate uh, of an adequate description but a question of its function as well what 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 does it do to have a description or a definition of art, right? So, and uh, the, the Maurice White's position, I have also his quote, it's, it's good to, to bear in mind, bear it in mind. He says, art itself is an open concept. We'll talk about open concept next session. We'll, we'll read a, a text by Lydia Gerr about open concepts and the, and, the, and the work as an open concept, the idea of work artwork as an open concept okay art itself is an open concept new conditions cases have constantly ar arisen and will undoubtedly constantly arise new art forms new movements will emerge which will demand decisions on the part of those interested usually professional critics critics as to whether the concept should be extended or not as aestheticians may lay down similar similarity conditions but now Concept. With art, its conditions of application can never be exhaustively enumerated since new cases can always be envisaged or created by artists or even nature, which would call for a decision on someone's part to extend or to close the old or to invent a new concept, e.g. it's not a sculpture, it's a mobile, right? What I'm arguing then is that a very expansive, adventurous character of art, its ever-present changes and novel creations, makes it logically impossible to ensure uh, any set of defining properties. We can, of course, choose to close the concept, but to do this with art or tragedy or portraiture, etc., is ludicrous, since it forecloses on the very conditions of creativity in the arts, right? So, there is something implicit in each each of these positions in the sense of a desideratum, right? What White's, Maurice White wants, wants to do is to answer, to, is his answering to these conditions of creativity in the art. So he's asking if it's, it's, it's useful for art to have a definition of art, while Puivet is responding, oh, he's making a confusion between the nature, the question of the nature, of works of art, which is an ontological question, and the question of the criterion of their identification, which is an epistemological question. Even though, as we so as we saw before, sometimes the the the, criter the criterion of identification is uh, a condition <clears throat> for the consideration of something as existing. Right. Also. The criterion of cons of of identification enters into the criterion of, in, in the, into the criterion of the nature of a work of art. So this is this class is this session is like a <coughs> huge mate leap 
uh, uh, I'm trying to map these complex relationships between these different uh, implicit assumptions of the, the, these various positions. Okay, so your question actually uh, gives gives way to this important <coughs> consideration. Okay. So, uh, what was what was uh, implicit in this Puivet's response? <coughs> I'm sorry <coughs> to uh, Maurice White's uh, quietism about about the ontology of art. So, there, what Puivet says is there is an there is an ontological question and an epistemological question. So. We are, we, we are, it is possible to isolate different ontological questions about art or works of art. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing four questions, four different questions. I'm not uh, uh, framing them as necessarily entwined in a specific way or not right i'm just saying it is possible to uh look look locate each one of these questions as a motivation behind sometimes one or two or three of them a motivation be as motivation behind a particular position in the ontology of artworks okay so uh, the, the questions are what is a work of art, which is the ontological question that Puivet is talking about. What is a work of art? How to identify something as a work of art, which is the epistemological general question. And pay attention, it's not, it's not the same question that Goodman is trying to answer, right? Because he's not trying to, with his theory of notation, he's not trying to identify, identify something as a work of art. But he's, he's, he's as, asking a different question, which is how to identify a work as the work that it is, okay? Which I'm calling the, uh, the, the singular epistemological question. So there is the general epistemological question, how to identify something as a work of art, and then how to identify a work as the work that it is which is also an epistemological question but about the identity of a particular work, not uh, as about the identity of something as a work, okay? So, and, and the last one, what makes the work what it is? The ontological question about the identity of the particular work. So the same question, the same difference that you can, you can locate between the question about the ident identifying something as a work and identifying something as the work that it is, you can uh, uh, map the same relation between the, 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 both the ontological questions, not just the epistemological ones. So what is a work of art? The ontological general question. And what makes the work what it is? Which is the epistemological question about the identity. Uh, sorry, the ontological question about the identity of the particular work. So, and also it's important to bear in mind the difference about the epistemological question, the ontological question about the identity of particular works. Yeah, the epistemological question is asking how to identify the work as the work it is, the work that it is, and the ontological question is asking what makes this work the work that it is. So, so what are the necessary components of this work to make what it is? And the other one is asking how we identify these necessary components that make this work as the work that it is. Okay, so these these four questions are the ones that I I I could locate that are the motivations for different uh, ontological positions. Normally, an ontological position is not answering to the four of them at once. Usually, they are motivated more by one question than others. Okay, and this 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 uh, accounts for much many of the differences between the positions. Sometimes the, the positions, uh, they look like they are in disagreement. Sometimes they are just asking different questions. And, and these produce different theories 
and by and the, and the, and, the, and the, there is a byproduct of this of these different theories. As a byproduct, we have disagreements between them, but the disagreements are not on the base; they are a byproduct because the the questions that made that that were that were the source of the position that the, the position was trying to answer are different sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> so these different ontological questions and the idea of oh, the French ontologists, okay, sorry. I'm just answering here the sidebar. I'm writing here for you. Roger Puivel. Uh, I don't think there's anything in English by him. I think it's all in French. Um, yeah, I think there is one book in English by him, which is not an, a book about ontology. It's a book about Wittgenstein, and it's very a very funny book because it's called uh, "After Wittgenstein, Saint Thomas." <laughs> he's a he's a he, he's a Thomist. I mean, a Wittgenstein and Thomas, this is it's kind of bizarre, but okay. Uh, so we are, we, we, we have under our, in our belts already, uh, quite, quite a complex situation, it seems, right? There are not only different positions as to the nature of artworks, but there are different positions concerning the ways artworks are identified as artworks and different positions concerning the way artworks are identified as the artworks they are. And also, there is the relationship between each and every one of the answers that are given to these questions and the data that are uh, harvested from the practice itself to construct the answers, right? So there's quite a complex picture already. So to be even more, uh, to, to complicate matters even more, uh, there are different positions that, as the, the position exposed by uh, Maurice Weitz, I, I, don't, I also didn't write White's name, maybe it's interesting for you guys. Maurice White's here in the sidebar, uh, which is a, a quietest position. It's a position that tries not to be ontological, right? He's, he's saying, ah, oh, you can't define it simply. It's better, it's better to uh, discern the different uses of the concept of art in the dif in different uh, in different uh, uh, contexts, right? Okay, so this brings forth the problem of ontology versus conceptual analysis. They are not uh, what I what I say uh, privative. I mean, it's not it's not a sine qua non thing. I mean. Either you do ontology, either you do conceptual analysis. Of course, ontology has to have conceptual analysis as a way to construct its categories. Okay, and inversely, you could you could criticize the conceptual analysis for having uh, ontological presuppositions. Okay, and this, if you read uh, Amy Thomason's te text, it's all about this. Okay. Actually, it's about ontology having already ontological uh, uh, presuppositions, which I, I would I would be tempted to couch in the terms that I was talking before uh, as ontology two having ontology two having ontology one presuppositions in the sense that ontology as totality is having uh, ontological in the sense of the concept of being presuppositions in order to. Uh, construct its position. Okay, so there's a, a mapping. This situation is quite complex, right? So about the conceptual analysis, I, I would give you a, a, a small paragraph by Frederic Neff. 
which is a Belgian ontologist. Uh, ontology may become, under the slightest pressure, conceptual analysis. But the opposite is not necessarily true. There is a type of intellectual entropy that pushes the intellect to fold upon itself instead of seek, seeking its object, essence, foundation, if any, and the structure of what exists. This force that is needed to unravel our understanding is the virtue of realism. Here is not talking about the metaphysical position of realism. He's talking about a certain virtue of realism that is something that is uh, that that uh, uh, is uh, makes uh, makes the philosopher uh, search the conditions of what exists instead of folding itself, fold folding thought upon itself. Right, so he's 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 a actually he is a, an ontological realist, uh, which he, this is this kind of this is also interesting the way in which, in which a particular particular position like realism maybe uh, uh, brings forth in a more dramatic way. The, the, the contrast between ontology and conceptual analysis than an idealist position. This is also an, a, an, another interesting and, and important yeah. theme of this of, of the investigation. But the idea here is that uh, there is like a, a relationship between what he's calling conceptual analysis, which I, I take to be something that is akin to what Maurice White is interested and something that is more akin to what Wittgenstein is doing in his second philosophy, for instance. Wittgenstein is not saying that there are such and such such things in the world. He's, he's uh, 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 investigating the ways we use concepts. But if, we, if, you, if you look into, for instance, the, the Heideggerian conception of ontology, it's all about presuppositions. I mean, meaning presuppositions from the design so it's as there's a the idea is that there's a slippery rope between one and another Frederick Neff thinks that uh, ontology is more easily turns into conceptual analysis than the reverse I don't agree with this idea right uh, I think they are both uh, they they both have a two-way a two-way uh, uh, relationship so, uh, as you, I don't know if you, everybody read the Amy Thomason's text, text but I, I take a, a phrase from it. One might try to argue that those who would ground the reference of an art kind term may do so merely by pointing to a sample, say, of objects from a very different culture and coining a term for works of art of that kind. But again, to do so, such would be grounders, the grounders of the determinate term, right? Must at least have some base level conception of what sort of kind an art kind is and what sorts of features are relevant to belonging to the same art kind as opposed to those relevant to belonging to the same chemical, biological, or physical kind. Okay. So what's what's going on there? Neff is saying. If you lose this, what 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 he's calling this, this virtue of realism, you will get caught caught up in con near conceptual analysis. And what Amy Thomason is saying, you would have to have a conception, a presupposed conception, in order to construct an ontological conception. So this, this is putting forward the relationship between also conceptual analysis and ontology, which is a, a, a different duality from the one we were talking about, the duality between ontology understood as the domain of being qua being and ontology understood as the domain of being qua totality, right? So it seems uh, I would be tempted to say that conceptual analysis is in the basis of 
any such endeavors. But you can, you can stay in conceptual analysis by uh, inside conceptual analysis, not, not go all the way to ontology by uh, suspending uh, the judgment of existence and of essence of such of such entities that the conceptual analysis is bringing forth right but the relationship i'm i'm just at this point giving you elements in order to understand uh, or think think through the issues that are uh, entwined in this idea of doing ontology and doing specifically doing ontology of a specific practice which puts forward this difficulty between the ambitions and the structure of the practice itself and these, uh, the ontology of its resulting objects, right? It's, re its results, the ontology of the results of this practice, okay? So any, any question uh, at this point? I am... Uh, uh, restarting the PowerPoint because I want to share something with you guys, but we can take this time to ask some questions. I have one crazy question that might be completely uh, off tangent, but I still I, I see the different uh, ontological models similar to uh, the different. Uh, views an insect has of 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 an of an object or uh, different ways of, of assessing it is this mm -hmm. completely crazy out of line or can you somehow make sense of that that's that's interesting thank you <laughs> yeah it's, it, no yeah it's interesting because it's it, yeah it is it has a definitely a crazy component but Nevertheless, the metaphor of seeing is important. And uh, just I, 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 would, I would ask you before I before I, I answer it more completely. Um, in what sense? In what sense an ontology would be equivalent to a different way of seeing by a different insect? So in what sense you are thinking about that? I think our, mod, our ontological models come out of our possi phenomenological possibilities, and they are phenomenological. You, you, you said phenomenological. Yeah, I, I think okay. it's um, from my uh, point of view, it's it's linked to to phenomenological models because we 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 can only assess a certain number of informations. Like I I can't I make uh, a model based on my knowledge of infrared, although okay. They, it's okay. there and 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 so on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, actually, you just you just answered your question, but okay. Uh, I, I would comment on it then. Uh, ontologies are products for me in the sense of ontology. Uh, on, on first, in the sense of being qua totality, and in the sense of the ontology of cultural products. I think they are results of scenes at scenes scenes as. It's not not just seeing, but scenes as which is a Silesian idea, that, or Wittgensteinian idea, for that matter, that uh, to, 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 to categorize something is not just to, to see it, just to look at it. It's to look at it in a certain way. And this looking in a certain way has a conceptual, has a conceptual uh, uh, implicitness about it, right? So, uh, in a sense, what I, what, I, what I was taking from your metaphor is, was the differences between the different insects, right? So yes, in a sense, when you construct an ontology, you are uh, there is there is selection, and there is emphasis. As I was saying, the the, the idea to put that the, the the four questions I I described to you guys was to have a uh, a way to recognize the 
the uh, the emphasis of a different of of each ontological position is it answering to the nature of art in in general is it answering to the nature of the artwork the singular artwork is it answering to the conditions of identification so in the sense it is a kind of seeing as you are seeing cultural project products in a certain way but in a certain way which is conceptually guided as well so this is different from the insects i mean if if we if we, if we uh, if we trust our our entomological uh, knowledge uh, this is different from from the insects right but uh, yeah in the sense it is it is a kind of seeing as and it has differences of selection you are selecting different components of the of the, the of the practices and you are also emphasizing different components and this is you are co completely right this is because of course a model does does not get everything from the target otherwise it's not a model right but the idea also is to question is ontology a model does ontology wants to be a model? What is ontology doing? So this this also appeared already when we were talking about Puivet's position and Puivet's criticism of whites, in the sense, oh no, uh, the the definition of art is a is a philosophical enterprise. It has nothing to do with art. I mean, well, then why you want to do it just for the sake of? of uh, an intellectual endeavor okay i understand this but what is the relationship then of this between this definition this so-called definition purported definition and the practice that pur it purports to define what's the relationship then right so which is a very dramatic question that imposes upon us when we start reading this different this literature about analytic ontology of art okay but yeah thank you very question. i answered you i mean did i superb superb okay, okay thank you uh any more questions yeah um i was wondering if you could comment kind of clear up in the thompson piece would you say she kind of calls for an open concept of art because if i remember she's i would say I was saying it's. I remember she was saying that the, I don't know if it's the ontology of art or she's asking the epistemological question, but it was that I remember she was recommending it should be guided by the practices and belief of yeah. those competent in the practice. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Uh, um, uh, Amy Thomason has her own ontology, right? So she is an ontologist, an ontologist of art, but. Uh, she belongs to a class of ontologists that are responsive to the minutiae of the practices, right? So they are trying to uh, compatibilize uh, ontologies' uh, uh, quest for definition, for for a, for a logical definition, a, a purified definition, and the way the practice is uh, unfolding so which is different she she actually she's positioning herself against a certain understanding of the of the ontology of art that is uh, modeled upon the ontology of science of scientific objects right or or of empirical objects oh you she, she's saying it's not it's not a it's not a uh it gets us in, in dire straits if we think of the ontology of art uh, as the discovery of, of uh, properties of a mind-independent field of objects out there. So he, she wants, in other words, to take into account the fact that the, the art practice is a practice by the same kind of being that is doing its ontology in a sense it's not something mind simply mind independent which you which, you, uh, which uh, properties you can discover but it's something that we are also creating as we go along 
So this is a fundamental problem. So I would say she, yes, uh, at least in this text, she's not she's not openly, uh, if I remember correctly, she's not openly endorsing the open concept idea, but it's compatible with the open concept idea. It's compatible, and uh, it's very similar. I I I, I know I I send the the text for today very late for you guys so i I don't, I don't think you you read the lydia Gur chapter but it's very compatible it's very similar to the lydia Gur chapter in the imaginary museum of musical work as well which is a superb chapter wherein she uh, compares the ontology the platonist ontology by gerald levinson with the nominalist ontology nominalist ontology, ontology. i I, re I resist to call it an ontology because nelson goodman didn't want it to be an ontology, but it is treated as an ontological position by the literature, by the re re relevant literature, right? But yeah, she's comparing uh, Levinson's Platonism to Goodman's nominalism. And uh, basically, she detects the same issue that Amy Thomason is detecting. They are both treating it as something that can be described uh, from aloof in a sense from 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 uh, from far away not something that is co-constituted by the concepts and by by the way we employ concepts we i mean you are i i think you are already seeing where i'm headed which is something like a uh Selar, wittgenstein and Selars and brandomian account of art practice in the way seems as are entwined with our use of concepts right so i'm not endorsing morris white's quietism either but uh what what i'm proposing and i'm i will use post-cajun aesthetics as a way to open to pave the way is to open the black box and to delve into the infrastructural uh ways in which these art objects are uh, uh, realized. So this asks for a different uh, ontological framework, so to speak, not a framework of objects out there ready to be described, but a framework of processes of constitution of cultural artifacts that are conceptually, come perceptually, sensibly motivated, constituted. Okay. Something like that. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me. Uh, did I answer you? Okay. Uh, okay, the readers of ontology. Let's see, share. Which was the page I wanted? Um, Define art, the, ontolog the ontological questions I was talking about, just so you have the, the, the slide there. What is a work of art? Ontological question. How to identify something as a work of art? How to identify a work as the work that it is? What makes the work what it is? Okay. Both the, the quotations about ontology versus conceptual analysis. Um, and now we get to the uh, the criterion that Goodman puts forward for a theory of notation. This is quite technical, but I think it's something we can uh, understand tentatively. But for now, and as we as we go during this course, you can ask questions or read materials. I think we will get to understand this quite well. It's not it's not that difficult actually. Well, uh, are you seeing the slides? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, there's, there's, there are five criteria for a notational system. It, bear in mind that not, uh, the, uh, the, the term notational system, in Goodman's sense, is not a, a generic notational system in the sense of any notation. It is a uh, technical term he's restricting the meaning of the term to mean just uh, a notation that answers to these criteria 
Okay, so there are five criteria. The first one is syntactic disjointness. Characters must be disjoint so that no inscription belongs to more than one character. All inscriptions must be syntactically equivalent, intersubstitutable without syntactic effect. Here is his. Uh, actually, this is this is uh, Lydia's Lydia Gers phrasing of it. Okay, uh, he, she's a. Uh, is uh, uh, differentiating between characters and inscription. A character is, I mean, the type, and an inscription is a token of that type, okay? So inscriptions must be syntactic, syntactically equivalent, is the idea that you can uh, re-inscribe the same character, and any inscription of a, a determinate character is equivalent syntactical, is substitute, substitutable, okay? This is guaranteed among a character's inscriptions if each inscription is a replica of all others. Among a, a one character inscription, right? Okay. Each inscription is a replica of all of others if it is an inscription of the same character. And the character are disjoint. They are disjoint. There are no, there, there is no uh, uh, intersection between them. Okay. Second, uh, second requirement. Syntactic differentiation. Characters must be finitely differentiated. For every two characters, K and K, line, every mark, M, that does not actually belong to both. Determination, either that M does not belong to K or that M does not belong to K line, is theoretically possible. You have to, you have to be able to differentiate between characters. Between uh, and determine to each character uh, one inscription belong. Okay, so this is different from disjointness. Disjointness has to do with characters being disjoint, and every inscription that belongs to a character to be syntactically equivalent to every other inscription of the same character. Okay, and syntactic syntactic differentiation has to do with the idea that characters are finite and you you can theoretically know to which character a given inscription belongs. Okay? Third uh, requirement, unique determination. Each character must uniquely determine an extension, the membership of which is invariant over context. This ambiguity of inscriptions is forbidden. Let me go forward and then I, I'll, 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 I'll go back to this one, okay? The fourth requirement is semantic disjointness. We are, we've seen this, this before, right? Disjointness. On one side, you have syntactic disjointness, which is the disjointness between characters. And then the other side, you have semantic disjointness, which is compliance classes must be disjoint. Compliance classes is like a complicated term to that which complies with the character. In the sense, for instance, of music, there is a character which is a determined, determined, uh, determined uh, uh, blob of ink in a, in a score, right? And this blob of ink has as a compliance class uh, a determined note, musical note, okay? The idea here is that as there is disjointness in the syntax, there has to be disjointness in that which the character referred to. So the compliance, this, has, this is what he's, he means with compliance classes must be disjoint. No intersection of compliance classes is admissible, okay? And then you have the fifth one, which is the same. We have the second one for syntactic differentiation. We have the, the same for the semantic side semantic differentiation given a compliant it must be sufficiently differentiated from any other so that determination that it complies with the character in question is possible okay so uh, you have two two uh, requirements in the syntax disjointness and differentiation then two requirements in the semantic side which are the same, disjointness and differentiation. And there is a, a middle term that makes the, 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 
makes the, the relationship between the two sides, which is a unique determination. Each character must uniquely determine an extension, the membership of which is invariant, invariant over context. So this is, uh, this is putting forward a notational system as a relationship, one-to-one -one relationship between characters and compliance, right? And this is the way he understands the identification of music. You know, uh, music is his paradigmatic case for the theory of notation, okay? If you understand the theory of notation, you, you get to understand the differences between score, sketch, and script, which are uh, the way he understands the symbolic system that is music and the symbolic system that is painting and the symbolic system that is literature. Okay, so let's go. Score is a notational system in the technical sense just deployed. And in that it is a notational scheme. He, he differentiates between system and scheme. A notational system is a system wherein uh, both the synthetic synthetical and the semantic or compliant side side have disjointness and differentiation okay but a notational scheme is just the synthetic side okay so a score is a notational system in that it is a notational scheme i.e it is syntactically disjoint and differentiated associated through a one-to-one -one relation to a semantically disjoint and differentiated domain this is Goodman's conception approximate to the system of music notation. It is, it is actually false, okay? Music notation does not answer to all these, all these, uh, I mean, in its, in its entirety, does not answer to all these requirements. It's not satisfying the, all these requirements, okay? It's, a, it's an approximate, but, but it is a, an approximation of them, right? Part of the musical notation system does uh, does logically comply with with these requirements. But for instance, if you if you see a score, there are notes there. Notes are determined uh, through this one-to-one -one relationship between marks and sounds. Yes, this is correct. But there are, there are tempo indications like fast or slow. And these tempo indications have intersections between them. They are not, they are not uh, disjoint, and therefore they are not differentiated. So you have, uh, you, you don't have uh, uh, not a notational system for the for the for the movement. I mean, for the, uh, I mean, whether the music is fast or slow, you can have it though. You can turn it into a notational system, though, if you add a metronomical mark, for instance. Then you are giving determined limits between one tempo and another, okay? But, yeah, this is an approximation. The music notation is, approxim is an approximation to Goodman's notational system. And, okay, a sketch is no notational system and no notational scheme either. It is what Goodman calls a representational system. There are no, there are no characters because there isn't this disjointness or differentiatedness. In that sense, every sensible difference in the system counts for the identification of the work. This is Goodman's conception of the system of painting. So painting does not, does not have, have an alphabet, right? What, what is a, 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 a notational scheme? Basically, it's an alphabet. You have an alphabet, which is a, 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 a disjoint and differentiated sy syntactical system, right? So you have this for music and you have this for literature, but you don't have this for painting. I mean, as Goodman understands, even though, even though in, uh, in, uh, in uh, digital systems, you can have like, uh, you can actually notate a painting by by attributing different values to the pixels that are composing the representational image okay but okay the book was from 74 okay so the idea is that uh, 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 painting 
does not have an alphabet. Okay, so this this uh, this uh, means that the way you identify a painting is fundamentally different from the way you identify a musical work because the criterion for the identification of the musical work is a notational criterion. Thus, the musical work is an allographic art form, not an autographic art form. Goodman has his this distinction between autographic and allographic. An autographic art form is one in which the history of uh, the history of uh, uh, constitution of the object counts for its identification. So painting is uh, paradigmatic for the autographic case. So you have the concept of forgery in painting. Somebody can make a copy of a painting, but only the original object counts as the artwork, the proper artwork. This is because you don't have an alphabet for painting. If what the artist, the painter, was doing was uh, specifying through an alphabet what the artwork is, there wouldn't be a problem in copying it, reproducing it, and every reproduction would count as the same work, just as in music, right? But this is not the case because you don't have an alphabet and this means that is uh, uh, that a painting is uh, uh, synthetically and semantically saturated that is you don't have limits between characters every difference of hue and color counts as a difference when you have an alphabet you are defining uh, differences that count right I mean, he, he talks a lot about that. There are, there are like, uh, mm, uh, you could devise an intermediary visual representation of an A which resembles a D, the letter A which resembles a D. But because you are in an al using an alphabet, you have to determine if this inscription belongs to an, the character A or the character D, right? So it's not any difference that counts. Oh, every difference will be, uh, uh, um, how do you say that, uh, uh, will be put in a, 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 a class of a determined character uh so that not every different different difference counts when you have an alphabet with a sketch this is different every difference counts so this is why i mean per goodman we value much more the original painting than any copy and etc okay so a script is what goodman calls a discursive system in it a notational scheme, syntactic disjointness and differentiation is associated with a non-disjoint and differentiated field of compliance. This is Goodman's conception of the verbal system of literature. Okay, so in literature you have synonymy, you have like the same word, uh, same 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 token, same tokens, words that are alike that actually mean different things. You know. And everything so there is nevertheless syntactic disjointness and differentiation i mean you have an alphabet for instance but the field of meanings associated with with this 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 system is not there they, they are not disjoint and differentiated okay so this is his understanding of uh, literature uh, So Goodman's ontology, I have this, uh, this quote from him. We have seen that a musical score is in a notation and defines a work. That a sketch or picture is not in a notation, but is itself 
a work. And that a literary script is both in the notation and is itself a work. This, uh, this has, a, has a reason that I, I didn't talk about, which is he <laughs> is also a, counter, a counterintuitive consequence of, of his, his, this manner of, of constructing the art forms as resulting from different symbolic systems, okay? So, for, since a, a literary text is defined both by the synthetic side, which is disjoint and differentiated, and a field that is a field of meanings that are not disjoint and differentiated, uh, what would define the uh, identity of a literary work for him was, is sameness of spelling. So he does not consider translations of a book as instances of the same book, for instance. So uh, since the semantic side is not differentiated and uh, disjoint, so you can't identify it from one language to the other, identify it as the same semantic result. So because of that, he only understands the original as an instance of the work. Translations are versions, are, are things that are related to the original work, but are ultimately, ultimately are not, not the same work. Okay, so this is why he's talking about is both in the notation and is itself a work. So a literary script has some properties that are common with a musical score and some other properties that are common with uh, the sketch or picture. Okay, so we have seen that a musical score, <coughs> sorry, is in a notation and defines a work. That a sketch or picture is not in a notation but is itself a work. <coughs> and that a literary script is both in a notation and is itself a work. Thus, in the different arts, a work is differently localized. In painting, the work is an individual object, and in etching, a class of objects. In music, the work is the class of performances compliant with a character. <coughs> In literature, the work is the character itself. And in calligraphy, we may add, the work is an individual inscription. Languages of Art, page 210. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> oh, sorry. I have asthma. Sorry. The passage indicates a point at which a description of the symbolic systems that define art form intersects with, an ontological, with ontological questions. Goodman's endeavor, animated by an anti-metaphysical spirit, ends up conjuring an ontological classification of artworks. In a sense, it is the reverse of the process mentioned by Frederick Neff in his quotation, ontology turning into conceptual analysis, in a sense. So what, what is the story of, uh, of Goodman, right? Uh, He's basically a nominalist, and actually, during his 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 career, he becomes a very very radicalized relativist and what he calls a irrealist. Okay, and uh, uh, so he's not interested in essences or or stabilized essences or abstract objects and any any of that he's he's interested in the ways that symbolic systems forms worlds make worlds this is his basic uh, take his basic thing so uh languages of art is not really a book about art even though art is its uh its main subject, its main uh, field of uh, experimentation, I would say. But it's a book of about sim different symbolic systems and different ways in which a symbolic system can be organized. Okay. 
Uh, sorry. Uh, let me. This is better. Okay. So, uh, it's it 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 starts as an investigation of uh, the structural components of different symbolic systems in this sense that I was I was talking about. But while it does this, it ends up proposing a classification of the different forms of art as belonging to a specific symbolic system from his classification. And this belonging has consequences for identifying a work of art, for instance. So this is kind of, a, I, I, was, I was proposing to read this like the reverse of what Frédéric Neff was saying, like how ontology can go back and fold uh, an ontology in the sense of a uh, investigation on the properties of a reality can fold the, this this thought this thought can fold itself onto itself and become conceptual analysis which would be an investigation of the presuppositions that are uh, that are uh, entwined in our concepts that we use to understand this reality. So this would be conceptual analysis, right? So you can, for instance, understand Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations in this sense, for instance. Uh, uh, the way one understands the world is the result of a certain form of life in a certain form of life is, is embedded in a, set of practices these practices are linguistic conceptual practices that are responsible in the last instance for our seeings as okay and this is uh what this is defining a form of life a culture so this would be conceptual analysis in the sense of Frederick Neff but not really an ontology because you are not categorizing elements of reality uh, not ontology in the sense of uh, of the on the being qua totality. Okay, so Goodman's example is kind is kind of interesting in the sense that he's starting from the ways of referring, representing, depicting, which are the functions of these symbolic systems, and these different ways of of to refer, depict, represent. Uh, give rise to different systems, symbolic systems, and these different systems end up defining different categories to which different artworks, art forms, uh, art forms uh, belong, and which categories which have consequences for the ways in which singular artworks inside the categories are to be identified. So you, you start with like a conceptual analysis of the ways of referring of symbolic systems and end up with a classification of different objects in a sense as to which symbolic system they use and the consequences of the use of a de determined symbolic systems are intrinsic then to a determined practice so it's not <coughs> it's not by fiat that we that we value originals in painting it is a result of the fact that there is not an alphabet to painting and therefore painting has to be an autograph autographic form of art okay <coughs> so uh this is interesting for me in the sense that uh to ask the question of uh, the possibility of ontology is, in a sense, to ask the question of the possibility of uh, extrapolating from our concepts. And inversely, 
to ask the question, to answer actually this question negatively, is to answer uh, negatively to the idea that we have so-called ontological presuppositions to the use of our concepts. So this is a charged, a very challenged philosophical question in the sense that uh, it, it sheds light on a bunch of different philosophical endeavors in the 20th century. And the reasons for which they are defining themselves as ontological or not, right? Or merely conceptual analysis, even though it is defensible that conceptual analysis, I, I, don't, I don't think even if it, it, that it is defensible, I think it's necessary. Conceptual analysis is necessary for ontology, and it's at least defensible that conceptual analysis has ontological presuppositions in it. And this is this is a, a certain picture, a certain picture which proposes a certain set of problems for understanding uh, a certain field of philosophical positions in the 20th, 21st century. Also, to complicate matters, ontology, as we have seen, has more than one meaning. So, uh, when you are doing ontology, what are you doing? Here we are talking about being qua totality because we are investigating, investigating the ways in which certain thinkers categorize certain domains of our experience, like artworks, for instance, or musical works, or paintings. What kinds of things are, are these? So we are in the domain of uh, metaphysical specialis. But uh, as Amy Thomason was saying, in order to do this, you have to have like a previous conception to disambiguate between different properties that would be captured by a term like artwork. So what are these presuppositions? <clears throat> a Wittgensteinian would say, oh, these are presuppositions that has to do with the concepts we have, with our form of life, and with the use we make of these concepts. A Heideggerian would say, these are presuppositions which has to do with the being of design, with the opening of a field of meaning to this, this specific being, which is capable of asking the question of being, which is design itself. So for one, it is a question of conceptual analysis devoid of uh, metaphysical stringency or ontological, better, it's better to say ontological because Heidegger at this point is not, is not endorsing metaphysics, even though a few years later he will, he will do it. So, uh, uh, non-ontological understanding and the other one has an ontological in the sense of the being qua being sense of ontological. So to differentiate these different, these notions of ontology, uh, ontology as being qua being, ontology as being qua totality, and conceptual analysis, and to, more than this, to locate different endeavors that purports to be some kind of clarification either of the concepts of art, either of the objects of art, demands, in a sense, to have clarity about the, dif the, the, the differences between these ideas. So this was the point of uh, this was the point of this of this first session, right? I'm not proposing an, a quick answer for this but to give materials in order 
to think through the consequences of adopting a specific stance, uh, either an ontological stance or a conceptual anal anal analysis stance, and towards a specific practice, for instance, artistic practice in, the, in this case, but also to think through the consequences of adopting a specific artistic stance in the sense that the, the way the practice is organized by a specific artist or by a specific uh, structure, action structure put forward by the artist, this puts forward a supplementary question, which is, up until here, we have been talking about the ways ontology responds to art in the sense of the ontologist looking at art and trying to capture some of the or some of its components in order to constitute its categories. But when we see it, from the side of the practice. A supplementary question appears is that, are there ontological consequences for a specific art practice, not art theory, but an art practice? And this is what is interesting in the sense of uh, uh, in the in the face of between analytic ontology and what I'm calling uh, with Liz Cotts uh, post Cajun aesthetics, in the sense that post Cajun aesthetics is riddled with, in a sense, com ontological commitments that are different from the ontological commitments that structured that are at first view at first view different from the ontological commitments that structured the common practice up until then so this is the hardcore thesis <laughs> and uh, but one should not either uh, refi these post Cajun aesthetics as in an event that is uh, unrelated to the state of art praxis, uh, praxis until then. So, in the in the in, during the the next sessions, we will be tackling the problem of this uh, rupture, normative rupture. I would I would call it, couch it in in the sense of a normative rupture, a rupture in the norms of a practice that oblige us to adopt different ontological commitments to make sense of this practice. Okay, but also the continuity, not just the rupture, that characterizes this normative rupture as still being art. And by, and by looking both as at the rupture and both as the continuity of the category of being art, right? My bet is we could not isolate as a bad word, but maybe make explicit components that would ultimately, as in the as a, as it's it's promised for the third session, the experience against art could ultimately produce a set of practices that aren't art anymore, but that stem from art, and this would be done by not wholesale rejection of the category of art as the 
historic avant-garde did, but by piecemeal revision of its components. The constitution of generic practices, different generic practices that could be not art. And inversely, in the fourth session, the art against experience session, the idea that art, the being art of something, can be a leverage point, a stability point wherein one could destabilize the uh, 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 destabilize the uh, coordinates of experience. And the idea of experience against art, I am referring to the rebellion of art, of art against the art institution and the idea of dissolving art into life, which is characteristic of historic avant-garde uh, uh, from a certain point of view, I am referring uh, to the Peter Burger book, Theory of the Avant-Garde, and uh, the, the, the inverse operation, the art against experience, the idea that there, are, there could be certain practices, and art is a, uh, like a uh, reduced field wherein one can experiment, so it can give leverage, in order to uh, question the idea of experience itself. So in one sense, you have the, uh, in a sense, an, an absolutization of experience against that which is, which differentiates itself from experience in this account, which is the autonomy of the art practices. And the second, you have the, uh, absolutization of this separation, this separate field, wherein you can uh, uh, examine and disordinate the coordinates of experience itself. And the, for this, I am referring to the Ray Brassier text, Genre is Obsolete, and the Martin text, Noise as Device, and the Brazilian artist text, uh, Hitival Ether. We will use this text in the last session okay <clears throat> uh, just to wrap it up before we we uh, I open to the last questions okay because we are approaching the end of the session it seems to me right uh, Patrick it's up until 2 or 30 right this is the idea okay so uh, Goodman's results, perfect compliance, that means that in the domain of music, a work is defined by the perfect compliance of the performance to the score. If a specific note is missed, the work hasn't been badly played, it wasn't played at all. The price Goodman pays for proposing a nominalist account of the identity of musical works is relaxed in Platonist accounts. The work is an abstract sound pattern instantiated in performances. In this account, malformed instantiations are acceptable since the work is not the class itself of performances, but the abstract pattern being instantiated. So perfect compliance is desirable, even though it's not necessary to, to say, uh, for, for us to, 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 to affirm that the work has been played. Even with the laxing of the perfect compliance, Platonism in the ontology of music betrays an ontological presupposition, as Amy Thomason was talking about. That is, in, that is in disagreement with relevant portions of the practice, such as post-Cajun aesthetics. The consideration of post-Cajun aesthetics will have consequences for a possible ontology. This is the bet uh, of, the, the, of the next session, okay? So I would like to take this 10 last minutes to take your questions. 
maybe, if there are any. So well done. I have, I have, I have a game that I play if something happens like that, and I start with Alex. Alex, do you have uh, some <laughs> something you want to respond or a question that you want to give to our professor? Uh, not at the moment. Um, I, I guess I would just question like the role of the of the museum or of the art institution within this context, because yeah. I understand that for someone like Danto that becomes like the fundamental characterizing principle of what generates the art object as art object. Yeah, I would take issue with that actually, because uh, it's not that being in a museum character characterize the art ob object as an art object. It is being in a museum, uh, uh, it's like a filter. Being in a museum, makes us look at something in a certain way and i think what what the art what the art portion of being an art object has to do is with this looking with this seeing as and the seeing as is not just being in, in a museum being in a museum is actually uh, filtering in the sense that patrick was was asking about the insects in the sense it's filtering our, per our perception in a certain way to look that to look that from a certain seeing as pers perspective. So I, I think I think the museum is important in the sense the institutional critique is important in a sense, and the institutional position uh, captures something. But uh, I don't I, I wouldn't say that it's sufficient actually. It wasn't a question, but uh, any, anyway, I, I, I gave it a, a comment. So. <laughs> any more questions? So uh, I have uh, Clementine. Do you want? Yeah, to... I, I don't know this person. Yeah, uh, sh she should maybe present herself because all the others did so. I would I would like to get to know the students. So. I, I think it's one of our professors for tomorrow, but I still don't know. Maybe it's one of the students. Uh, if I don't hear anything, I'll ask Hutch. Hutch, do you have a question or a response that you want to give to us? So it doesn't need to be a clear cut uh, question. It can be just a remark like Alex. Uh, now I can. I was wondering if you could touch on something really quickly. Is there any way you can quickly respond to uh, how post-Cajun aesthetics are betrayed? Sorry? by the, uh, How uh, the Platonic view of the intelligent artworks betrays the uh, practices of post-Cajun aesthetics? Oh, okay, okay. I can I can respond to that, of course. Uh, for instance, uh, there are. I could, there are more models, but I, I could propose, I could uh, describe two basic models, like hard Platonism, which is the one I just described in order to be like, in order to have a contrast with the nominalist position, the maximal contrast, which was to uh, illustrate the possible diversity of ontological positions, which is the idea that the work is a instantiated abstract sound pattern. Okay, this has consequences because uh, abstract sound pattern cannot be created, right? Abstract objects are not created in, in, in the Platonist sense. If you if you if you are a Platonist about math mathematics, you are talking that well there is this reign of non spatial temporal objects that are uncreated nobody creates numbers they are always already there right so the problem with there is a pro, there is a con, there is a radical consequence of platonism which is uh, that which is revisionary that 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 works are not created works are discovered you have to discover a pre-existing sound pattern so what the composer is doing is that he's discovering a pre-existing sound pattern. This is the first model. The second one is like a moderate Platonism, which is Gerald Levinson 
model that uh, Lydia Gur is talking about, which, he, which in which he says, because of this extreme idea that composers are not composing the works they are composing, that are is the result of hardcore Platonist position. Uh, Levinson proposes a moderate position in which composers do compose their works because the works are not just the sound patterns. They are sound the sound patterns with the means of performance indicated at a certain time in history. So Levinson proposed the category of indicated structures. So compose means to indicate a structure that has as its, as its components an abstract uncreated sound pattern. The sound pattern remains uncreated. This is that that is because uh, it, is, it is because of this that uh, Levinson is still a Platonist. It has an abstract object in his account, but uh, the work is not just this sound, sound pattern, but the means of performance. And strangely, he puts into the definition of work the time t wherein the, the the work was composed. Because if you don't put the time where the comp the work was composed, there is a question, a metaphysical question of whether it is possible for two composers to compose the same work in different times of history. So he, he doesn't want to have this consequence. So he's saying, ah, it's an indicated structure composed by the sound pattern plus performance means plus the time of composition. So, okay, but your question wasn't about where Platonism divorce itself from practice, but the opposite, where Platonism is feeding from the, the practice, the presuppositions that Platonism has in the normal practice, right? This was a question. Well, the, from this description I gave you, you can see that there is like a, a kind of negotiation going on in order to accommodate the Platonist account to the practice. Hardcore Platonist was too severe, so there, there's moderate Platonism. And the idea of a sound pattern itself as an uncreated object that is a component of the work, which is I, under, I, I agree is, is something completely, uh, at first sight, completely divorced from practice. But this, don't, don't, don't forget that this is due to the idea that music is supposed to be repeatable so it is answering to a component of common practice which is the way we name the same name different performance with the same tag because they are in a sense the same so when when platonism starts trying to answer to this component of of common practice you could frame it, okay, it's just trying to deal with something that is in the practice. It's not presupposing it, but I think it's presupposing it in the sense that they are saying that a musical work is an instantiated sound, sound pattern, which, ha which is the same as saying that a musical work has in itself, uh, in the concept of musical work itself, the idea that it is repeatable. So, it is re metaphysically reifying a component of a practice, but not every musical work is repeatable, as per the post cajun aesthetic is, is able to demonstrate in this sense. Did I answer you? Yeah, yeah you did. Thanks. Is any, anyone, anyone more? I think we have two minutes still. <laughs> so, uh quick since you will present next week do you have a question sorry uh, quit do you have a question for next week uh, uh no i think uh i think we've got a, a ton of stuff to digest here before next week but uh, <laughs> uh i guess the um i mean my i i'm also a musician and, and i think uh I, I think the the relevant point for me was that just basically what you just said is that I mean we we now obviously understand that there are mu there's music that is not repeatable, um, and there are different um, there there there's music that's not inherently 
notatable. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've done some preliminary reading of like Adam Harper's infinite music and different ideas of variables as music and have some of my own concepts, of course, but, um, um, but I, I, I think it's interesting, like, and, and understanding that the, that the music part of it is kind of just uh, is an example of, of applying this large, uh, uh, more broadly to art, but, uh, um, it's it's very interesting to me, and I look forward to kind of digging into this over the next week and really kind of getting my head around everything. Great, great. Uh, I'm I'm glad there's a musician in class because so uh, we have also this more profound uh, engagement with this question, this particular question of of the identity of musical works, which is something that post Cajun aesthetics will start from, even though it will not stop there. Post Cajun aesthetic will be will become a multimedia endeavor this is what the the point of the lee scott's text for next week okay i think we reached the end of the session i mean if there is no no more questions but but i'm able to stay a few more minutes if anyone has still questions that needs to be answered today so uh, i'll just uh, super, i just want to ask you so please speak I didn't have a question actually, but just before leaving, I thought it good. Um, what about recorded music? Okay, I think that's a good question. Uh, there are let me let me search my mental archives, but there are different treatments of this of this question. What do you mean by recorded? I, I, I fear the answer will be too long, but okay. What do you mean by recorded music? Recorded music can be like an, uh, a, a specific piece that was recorded, right? And this would have a certain ontology. It can mean, uh, recorded music can mean something that intrinsically recorded, like electronic music. There's no performance in it, just the recording. So this has a different ontology. For instance, can have a different ontology. For instance, uh, if I re remember correctly, there's a debate about uh, pop music in ontology. This guy I was talking about, Roger Puivet, says that the work in pop music is not the song. It is the, how do you say that in English? Because this text is in French. Uh, it, is a, it is a recording. It is a phonogram. He's defending this because uh, uh, our primary way of, because of something that is common practice, that is our primary way of relating to a pop music work is through a record, an album in general, or a song you listen to in the radio or in Spotify, whatever. So he's saying, oh, they are doing the phonogram. The phonogram is the work. Then the question, arises of what they are doing, what they are playing when they are playing it live. Then He's saying, well, they're not playing the, the work. They're playing a portion of the work, which is the song. And there is the, in, the inverse position that says, no, pop music is composing the song. The song is the work. So what is the recording? Oh, the recording is a, ver a fixed version of a work which is variable, so in a sense, uh, it acquires, the recording has different properties than the work itself. The work is still a work for performance, in the sense it's allographic, but recordings are autographic, in the sense of Goodman. Remember, autographic is, it doesn't have an alphabet. Every difference, per sensible difference, counts to the determination of the, of the, of the identity of the, of the work. So a recording doesn't have an alphabet. So when you listen to a, a determined, uh, determined uh, timbre, like an electronic timbre in a pop music album, it is that timbre. When they play live, it's, it's, it's slightly different. So if the work is autographic, that doesn't count as the same work, even though you have to create some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, compromise in order to make sense of common practice of calling them the same thing. So 
what they usually say is that oh it's a version of the same of the work which is ultimately a different work but it's casual uh, causally related for, for sense uh, but also uh, uh, phenomenologically related even though not the same so there's in and there's more more to be said about recorded music okay this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg but okay did i answer you okay thank you everybody then i hope it was uh, an okay uh session <laughs> and see you next week i think well thanks for this amazing session okay thank you great thank you okay. yeah thank you see you next week Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. 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 bye.